cousins as well. So I can invite you for a confirmation, Mar Member Guy. So Member Guy move for confirmation, seconded by Member Cousins. Thank you very much. Any matters arising from the minutes? No? Okay, thank you. Madam AG, uh, let me welcome you, and could I invite you to introduce the team that is here with you? Good morning, Chairman, members, and the contingent from the Ministry of Health. Today I have with me Deputies Auditor General Carolyn Lewis and Gail Lulim, accompanied by Hyacinth Williams, Kamla Farkinson, Sandy Daly, Alicia Richards, Rochelle Bailey, Ricardo Hall, and Kevin Wright. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Blake, could you introduce your team from the Ministry of Finance? Morning, Chair members and the rest of persons. Um, Hope Blake, Deputy Financial Secretary, and with me today is Barrington Thomas, Head of the Accounting and Financial Policy Unit. Thank you. Mr. Brand, Permanent Secretary, could you introduce the team from the Ministry of Health? Can we check that the mic is plugged in and working? Uh, plug it into another one. Okay. So thank you very much, Chairman, um, members of the committee, Auditor General, members from the Ministry of Finance. My team comprises of my chief uh, principal finance officer, Mr. Donovan Davis, the chief medical officer, um, Dr. Jacqueline Bissesa McKenzie, my chief technical director um, for policy, uh, Mr. Howard Lynch. Chief Technical Director for uh, Regional Co Coordination, um, Ms. Maureen, Maureen Golding. We also have representing here the Regional Director for the Southeast Regional Health Authority, Mr. Errol Green. My Chief Internal Auditor, Ms. Michelle Walker. And there are a few other members of the team that their name does not um, I don't know if they would be willing well, to. Well, I'll just ask them if they could introduce themselves so we know who is here. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Thank you about that. Thank you for that. Could those members who weren't introduced by the PS just indicate the positions you are from and we're in the Ministry of Health? Roxanne Henlon, Senior Director of Public Procurement, Southeast Regional Health Authority. So that's, okay. that's, that's the. Thank story. you. Mm -hmm. It's our custom, we ask the Auditor General to offer some opening remarks, and then P.S., we'll ask you to respond with brief opening remarks before we go into the details. So, Madam Auditor General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I take it that you want me to speak to the matter in the annual report, or do you want me to speak generally? Well, we, there are three sets of issues we're going to be looking at, the annual report for 21-22, the compliance audit compendium report, and also the performance audit. We're going to take them in order, but you can, as I said, just generally, because they're going to be, I know, a lot of questions on each. Okay, Mr. Chairman, um, if I'll set the context for our reports as uh, is revealed in the annual report, the compendium report representing the review of the COVID-19 expenditure by the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and to some extent the performance audit report, there is evidence that there is significant room for improving the accountability and governance process at the Ministry of Health, and I say this against the backdrop that, as you will see from the annual report, the recurring issue of the absence of financial reports. 
And now these financial reports are not only required by the Constitution, but you will appreciate that every organization must give account for its stewardship over the financial resources allocated um, and in our case appropriated under the Act. In this case, the Ministry of Health has been found wanting for a number of years. The 2022 report speaks to a nine-year deficit and a table is provided. Mr. Chairman, I also want to bring to your attention that the Ministry has responded to say that action is being taken to address the deficit and we should be provided with the appropriation accounts in, um, in, in soon order. However, the Ministry gave the same commitment in 2018. In fact, the annual report of tw for 2018 said that the Ministry has since indicated that the outstanding appropriation accounts will be completed by the end of the financial year 1819. 1819 pass, no appropriation accounts. 1920 pass, no appropriation accounts. 2021, the ministry provided um, an additional reason um, in the frame of the challenges with the Finman system, but indicated that it had been resolved and the accounts were with the internal auditor to be reviewed. Well, 2022, we received the same explanation with the same um, promise to present the financial statements. Now, we're talking about in total $560 billion, Mr. Chairman, for which the ministry has not um, fulfilled its financial and um, fiduciary responsibility to provide a report on the, I'll just give a synopsis as it relates to the COVID-19, which I believe the same weakness in the um, financial governance arrangement is revealed in the expenditure process for the COVID-19 expenditure. And, and let me just um, hasten to add that I do understand that it was an emergency and of course, it was unprecedented. So the ministry was expected to respond in a manner that it had not responded before or be called on to respond. However, that does not negate the need to ensure that the expenditure meet the requisite guidelines that exist and that accountability and transparency is preserved. I also want to indicate that the audit of the COVID-19 expenditure was executed in June 2020, having advised the ministry in May 2020 that we were going to execute the audit. And the purpose of that audit is not to castigate the ministry but recognizing, as an Auditor General, recognizing the, the, the emergency situation and the likelihood that controls would be relaxed and the significant sums of money involved, because we're talking about over $8 billion that was allocated to the Ministry to execute its responsibility under the COVID-19. We used the audit as a means of a preventative and a corrective measure. And so it was, whereas we did not do the real-time audit as we did for the COVID care program, I commissioned an audit that I call a near-time audit because we just didn't have the resources to do a real-time audit as we did in the other cases. So the aim of this audit really was to identify weaknesses and provide um, guidance to the ministry. I believe that the cover letter that we sent to the ministry setting out our intent to audit the expenditure actually provided to, in my, um, my opinion, the expectation, something as basic as contracts, which is going to be a maybe a contentious issue here this morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, I gather that the Permanent Secretary will address his, his own views on that. But overall, we're talking about 619 million, I think, as at March 31st, 2021, 
plus 124 million for infrastructure payments that were made um, that I just cannot, just cannot conclude that I'm satisfied that the systems were in place and the evidence exists that the government received the value for all the monies spent, Mr. Chairman. And, and that's really the crux of the matter. As it pertains to the performance audit, I think that speaks for itself. We were, and I, I want to, 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 to also just give a bit of background to say that that audit really is a part of a wider global initiative, which I believe the UN um, supported the WHO, would have produced a position paper that I know the, the permanent secretary is aware of in 2021, I believe. And that audit, as well as the toolkit of 2019, was used as the criteria just to assess the resilience of the health system, the gaps that exist, and what needs to be done. Um, having said all of that, Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I, I wouldn't want to end without saying that there were not good practices identified by the, um, during the course of our audit by the Ministry of Health, and those are outlined in the, in, in, in the report. In fact, one of them, and I think that that was also the case for the performance audit, where we saw um, the stakeholder engagement, the um, involvement and inclusiveness um, by the, the ministry. We also saw um, plans, which we consider to be good plans. But then again, as in the case of other entities, execution. Um, is where I believe the, the ministry came up short. So I'll stop there for now, Mr. Chairman. And All right, thank you, Madam AG. P.S. Uh, All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to provide some clarity on what we believe were very important pieces of work done by the Auditor General's Department. In the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the executive management team takes pride in the fact that we acknowledge the importance of audit and review for good governance. Good governance and the rule of law, um, Chairman, are one of the critical pillars of what we try to practice as an executive management team in the Ministry of Health and Wellness. So we welcome these audits. We welcome um, the the information provided in the audits and we are here to provide some clarity because we think that the reports do have some challenges in terms of their context and the lack thereof. We just want to remind the committee and for the purposes of the record that the audits were done under section 25 of the FAA Act and in terms of the compliance audit we want to draw um, particular attention to the um, 25.3 of that act that says essential records are maintained and the rules and procedures framed and applied are sufficient to safeguard control of government property. And we also want to point out section 4 that says the provisions of this or any other enactment relating to the administration of public, um, public money and government property have been complied with. It's very important that we, we anchor everything that we do, Chairman, in the framework of good governance and the law, what is prescribed in law. And therefore, it's very important that we understand that neither myself, nor the Auditor General, nor anyone in this room are at large. We are confined to the prescriptions of law and rules. And because we're a rules-based society, um, Chairman, we have to ensure that when we do these types of exercise and we scrutinize the, the work of the ministries that it is underpinned and undergirded by the law. And I just wanted to make those preliminary comments and I am open now to any points of clarification, any questions that may be um, posed at this sure. time. Thank you, Piers. I, I'm going to start the, and I'm starting with the absence of the appropriation accounts. I have seen your letter 
dated March 20th, and a commitment, a timetable of a commitment to bring the accounts up to date. What I want to ask is, what are the issues that are preventing the ministry from having timely appropriation accounts? Is it financial resources, technical expertise? Can you outline what are those challenges for us? So, uh, Chairman, the first challenge that we had, we pointed them out, and I think the Auditor General made mention of that, where the Finman, which is a legacy system for the um, records from that period, um, was not operational in, so that you can pull the records to do the audit, um, to do the internal audit and the internal audit review so that the statements can be produced in time. The context here, however, is that when the Finman came up and was ready, the ministry was engulfed in the implementation of our response to COVID-19. And therefore, it is, it is important that we recognize that the resources of the ministry were otherwise um, detained. The fact of the matter is, though, Chairman, given that we are now outside of the different uh, issues related to COVID-19 in terms of the complexities and the burdens that are associated with, um, with responding to the epidemic or the pandemic, we have been able to provide a more suitable timeline. Recall, Chairman, that for nearly 18 months to two years of the pandemic, um, there were several instances at the Ministry of Health where we had outbreaks of COVID. And during those times, the internal audit unit itself was completely um, isolated and, um, not isolated, what do you call the word now? Quarantined. Quarantined. And you will call for some time during COVID-19, Chairman, that you had to get two negative, a lot of people don't remember these things, you know. You had to get two negative tests to come out of. Uh, come out of. You're asking me personally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I probably got about five negative <laughs> tests. But, but, but P.S., yes, the, 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 yeah. the, the Auditor General identified this as an issue from sure. 2018. Sure. for which you would have made commitments and not been able to honor. So I, I accept the context of COVID yes. and how the ministry would have been diverted to deal with that national emergency. But the reality is that this problem is an ongoing problem, which would have sure. come up before. So we want, I'm happy to see the commitment, but yeah. I want to ensure that when we follow up, that what you have committed to is actually done. Yes, and just to set context again, um, during the during 2018, 2019, the audit, internal audit unit had four, four officers that were responsible for the review of the entire ministry. Now the internal audit unit has, how many officers in the internal audit unit now? Eight officers. So we have doubled the number of officers um, in the internal audit unit to provide for this review. And so we are able to give that commitment um, that we have provided to you, knowing that we have the resources to, pro um, to ensure that we comply. And the internal audit unit, and what we have also done, what we have also done, Chairman, is that we have elevated this particular criteria to the performance, um, the performance management of the unit. So the PMAS, which was introduced in the ministry in 2020, um, requires that officers have a work program that they are measured against. You know, for those of you who are in the public sector, you'd understand that the PER is the archaic um, system. Now well, we have you're using a lot of acronyms that okay, most of us won't know. Okay, so the performance know. evaluation, um, the performance evaluation system is the older system. We are using the performance management and appraisal system, which is called PMAS. And in the, P the performance evaluation system did not look at outputs and deliverables of the individual officers. The PMAS does. And so what we have done is to escalate the achievement of the, of the um, requirements that you have in hand to a performance indicator in the operational plan of the ministry and the work program of the chief internal auditor and the principal finance officer. So now it is something that is going to be measured in terms of performance. So I am, I am, I think I, I stand confident in believing that we will be able to make this commitment. And um, yeah, so that's my response. Uh, before I go to members, please. So this new system, applies across the board to all employees 
not just in the, the Ministry central of Health. ministry in the central ministry in the central ministry yeah. of health but it's not across the entire public service there are still some ministries who use uh, the PER which is all the system all right member siblings thank you chair um Mr. Pierce, could you just state how many of the appropriation account has been completed and with the internal audit unit just now? All the years have been completed and have been submitted to the, um, to the internal audit unit. So it would be fair to say that the, the appropriation accounts have been prepared but the challenge is really with the internal audit unit in reviewing same. Right. The verification process is where um, we are um, lending more resources to the internal audit unit to do that verification process. I am told that the verification process for one audit can take up to three months to do. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit more comfortable knowing that the appropriation accounts have been prepared and is only left for reviewing because initially I thought they weren't prepared and they were still in the middle of the process. So um, that is some comfort and we are hoping that the internal audit unit will get to review. Do, and and you, you have submitted a time schedule. Yes. On this. Thank you. Yes. All right, Member Guy, then Member Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Um, P.S., you indicated just now that the numbers have increased from four to eight. Um, so basically, the time frame that you have given us um, is based on this eight. All right. Um, the, the I should say yes, right, for the record. I should shake my head, sorry. <laughs> the period... Um, the, the time frame of up to three months that your internal auditor gave you just now um, was predicated on the four being there before the eight? No. Okay. No, no. So it's currently eight? Yes. All right. But um, how long has this been eight now? Uh, we, we had the full complement of eight since 20... 2020. 2020. Yeah. Was that a consequence of the COVID pandemic and are they permanent or temporary employed? No, they are permanent staff. We, mm -hmm. we did a, a, a review and we also accelerated some recruitment processes. It's, it's a difficult, um, it's, there are diff several issues that affect the audit groups um, and the recruitment of auditors mm -hmm. for the Money. audit group. Mm -hmm. um, some of the challenges that we face um, relate to compensation. Mm -hmm. um, we look forward to the impact of the recent compensation restructuring for this group. Um, however, we understand and appreciate that for other terms of our staff job descriptions, um, it still poses a problem. We, we launched a tender to ac acquire an auditor for IT because we in the Ministry of Health have been launching several different IT interventions to improve service delivery. And the function of IT audits, as you would appreciate, becomes that much more um, important to review the structures, the IT structures, to protect um, user information and user, um, user reliance on the system. And so, we went to market for that, and it, we still have not found uh, an IT auditor to, based on the salary level that we have, even with the compensation review. Um, we found one officer, and when we advised them of the amount that they would be compensated, you know, they were like, that's, that's not appropriate for the level of work and the competencies that, we, that they want. So we were not successful in recruiting that officer. Yes. By letter dated March 20th, there was an indication that the, the unit had started the verification process for 2013, 14, 14, 15, and has advised that it will be returned for some corrections. Has that been done, and when is a new timeline on that? 
Um, can I allow the internal auditor sure. to respond to that question? You can just um, respond. Just use the microphone. Just identify yourself for the records. Huh? Yes, good morning. My name is Michelle Walker, Acting Chief Internal Auditor for the Ministry of Health. Okay, so based on the schedule, I would say that we're still in line. We have completed 2013-14 and 2014-2015 verification. So we should be sending back that statement to the Finance and Accounts Department by April 110. We have also commenced the 2014-15 and 2015-2016 financial statements verification. I, I think based on what you have said, there's some discrepancy in terms of what is on paper here. Um, you kept referring back to 2014-15 in terms of commencement. Um, are you saying therefore that the 13, 14, and the 14, yeah. 15, which were a return for some corrections, have been sorted out. All right, the 20, let me repeat myself. All right, we have not yet returned those statements to the Finance and Accounts Department, but we'll do so by the end of April. Okay, and, and concurrently you have started the 15, 16, and 16, 17? Yes. And those are still on track for completion by June of this year? Yes. Okay. Assuming there's no more um, correction needed. All right, Member Clark and then Member Cousins. I yield, Mr. Chairman, the question were asked by my good colleague. All right, Member Cousins. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, P.S. Earlier, you responded um, by saying that <clears throat> the verification process for one audit is three months. By one audit, you mean for one financial year? Yeah, for one financial year. So for one financial period, yeah. Therefore, we're talking about nine financial years now. Nine financial periods, yes. Yeah. So that's 27 months. If you, do them, if you do them sequentially... If you do them sequentially, yes. But it's not a sequential transaction. We are saying that we have different audit teams dedicated to this particular process. So what we are saying is that the effort is three months for each one. We are not saying that it's sequential. Uh, so, th so the point is that to complete the internal verification for these nine financial years, is it going to take us 27 months? Whether you do it sequentially or not, are you saying will, that to complete the internal verification may take us up to 27 months? No, it may take 27 months in terms of <clears throat> effort, but in terms of time elapsed, no. Our plan has been tabled in terms of how we intend to execute um, the, the implementation of it, and we intend to adhere to that plan. So there are you know, so yes, in terms of effort, if you want to measure effort, yes, it's 27, um, as you would have reflected. But in terms of elapse of time, it is not, because it's not a sequential transaction. <clears throat> but, but you would agree that um, nine months is really, nine years of backlog, basically, and delay. When the FAA basically speaks to you, having an obligation. Sure to provide these reports mm -hmm. up to four months, I believe, after the end of the financial year. Mm -hmm. Now, as PS, what do, you, do you have a plan or do you have a timeline in place to ensure that you ramp up the resources within the ministry to complete all of this internal verification um, earlier than 27 months? Because to wait 27 months, and I still, I'm still sticking with that based on what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is unacceptable. No, so I'm I, wondering I, I, what, 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 what are you doing as a ministry to ensure, right, you don't want to circumvent the process and compromise the process. But still, I mean, based on the years of delay, I believe it is important that it's, we're dealing with how much, 500 and a half billion dollars, you know. 
That's half of what is allocated for this financial year. So with due, with due respect, member, I, I clearly outlined what the actions are and what the actions we, we are taking to ensure that we comply and that we provide the reports within the commitment in our letter that we submitted in March. So I'm not certain that I concur with your position um, at this time. What we have said before, member, is that the issues relating to the Finman, the legacy system, a system that has been um, archived to a large extent, is that, I don't know if that's a good word to use, caused significant challenge in producing the statements for us to do the audit. And that cannot be ignored. That is context. That is not um, fabricated information. That is fact. And given the fact that we have now been delayed and have the, and we recognize and we accept, uh, we at no point in time did we challenge that this is a major governance issue. And we accept it as a governance issue. However, what we are saying is that the context in which that occurred is outside of the control of the Ministry of Health. The, this, the Finman system is owned and operated elsewhere. And what we have decided to do was to improve the delivery of that system, um, delivery of our reports. And so we have given this commitment and we intend to stand by it. And I stand behind the commitment that we have given and the team has, has also it, um, committed to the um, standing behind what we have provided in our letter. So you're no longer employing the Finman system, eh? The Finman system has been, um, is now with the CTMS. C CTMS? Hmm? Yes. The CTMS is Central Treasury Management System, which is a new system. It's not the Central Treasury. What's the new system? The GFMS. The GFMS, sorry. The GFMS. You um, use explain those terms again for what <laughs> I I I'm, I am challenged, sir. So I will defer to my my PFA. The government financial management system. All right, go ahead, member. Because so, PS. Um, so section twenty four one of the FAA Act, as I indicated earlier, um, provides for the provision of these reports of the four months after the end of the financial year. Where we, you have cleared up the backlog, in a sense. Um, are we now saying that going forward, we shouldn't be seeing this issue um, where we have two, we three years at a time? Um, in, so in the back? The, so the, the backlog, we're working on the backlog, and I'm advised um, that we are current with the, with the, with the year that we are. So. Yes, we are intending not to have the um, existence of backlog going forward. So we are working on two different, on, on two different streams of work. We're clearing the backlog and we are make, maintaining that we are consistent with the um, current statements. Thank you, Chairman. Thank oh, you, Peter. Auditor General. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so the Permanent Secretary introduced an issue here that I was not aware of, and that is of the internal auditor that the internal auditor is in fact having um, an issue with the review of the appropriation accounts. There's a matter that I would really like the Ministry of Finance um, representatives to respond to because I'm a bit concerned about the timeline that you provided just now with respect to the review of the appropriation accounts, the three months to review mm. one year whether it is recurrent, capital A, B, seems extraordinarily long. Mm -hmm. And I say that against the backdrop again? that the internal auditor is not required to give assurance. The internal auditor is just doing preliminary checks. The audit is undertaken by the Auditor General's Department. It is the Auditor General that forms an opinion on the mm -hmm. appropriation accounts. And invariably, P.S., you may not know this, but when the appropriation accounts are submitted, they're riddled with errors. 
despite the review. Why? And I would not blame the internal auditor because the level of substantive testing that the Auditor General's Department would undertake, understandably, would not be undertaken by the internal mm -hmm. auditor. So I think that we have to look back at that process because I, what I am detecting is a great level of inefficiency taking place. The internal auditor is likely carrying out an exercise that will have to be repeated by us. And it has to be repeated by us because of the standards with which we comply before I form an opinion on that. So I think that is something for us to look back at. And certainly I'm not expecting that my team would be taking three months to complete the audit of an appropriation account for any one particular year. The second matter is as it relates to the Finman system. Was the Ministry of Finance made aware, and I would like the Ministry of Finance to respond here, um, about this issue bedeviling the Ministry of Health, because we received this as, uh, as an explanation two years in a row. And uh, as I said, besides that, we had not been provided with any expansive details because that response generally came at the end of the year before the matter was included in the annual report. Those are my comments. All right, Mrs. Blake, before you answer, I would also add a question. If you could indicate for other ministries what is roughly the time frame for the, the verification of these appropriation accounts? All right, Mr. Thomas is going well, to well, answer. One second. Member Sibley's wanted to ask a question related to that. It's, it's really related to, to what the Auditor General has said, what <coughs> Member Cousins was asking, and what the Permanent Secretary had outlined. I would really love to know what is the procedure per se, the policy, what is the policy with regards to appropriation account being um, sent to the Auditor General Department for review. Is it a policy from the Ministry, coming from the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Health that um, appropriation accounts should be reviewed by the internal auditor first, and then subsequent to the internal auditor reviewing same, it is then submitted to the Auditor General's department for the Auditor General to give her opinion on the financials. That's what I would really want to know. Is it a policy and where that policy is coming from? I, my, I will comment with regards to um, whether review of accounts will take three months and, or six months or one month. My own experience is that no, no one can really tie down how long some time a, financials, a set of financial will take because it is left to um, a number of things that I will not, I rather not go into, but I will not say that it will, it will take three months. Even with the PS, with all due respect, PS, um, you know, even with the best of efficient system and so on, sometimes I know financials and I have had experience seeing financials taking longer than three months. So I will not hold anyone <laughs> to a time limit as it relates to the review unless you are saying based on experience and it is going to, to, to take this time. So I yield there no chair until I get the feedback from the Ministry of Finance who will um, really say what is the policy direction from the Ministry of Finance and maybe the Ministry of Health can say, add to it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Barrington Thomas here, Ministry of Finance. And on the issue of the instruction, what gives the instruction in terms of the procedure or the process for 
appropriations account verification. Now, virtue of section 51 of the FAA Act, it requires or gives the financial secretary the authority to issue what is called financial instructions. These financial instructions are, is an administrative document that gives the general operational process flow in terms of management uh, of the financial accountability process. In this financial instruction, there is a requirement for appropriations accounts to be submitted to the Auditor General. And in that requirement, and I believe I can't remember the section just now, but it's that section that deals with annual reports. It indicates that prior to submitting any annual report to the Auditor General, these reports must first be verified by the Chief Internal Auditor. So that is what gives uh, the, the, the process or the outline, the required process that is required. Now, as it relates to the general uh, um, time frame that is uh, taken by an internal auditor to do this verification. The Ministry of Finance had not give any timeline on this. This is an internal um, decision, but it must be done in a matter that will allow for smooth um, submission within uh, to have those reports being tabled in the parliament within that required four month period after the end of any given financial year. So those are the, the, the processes. Right, members, you can follow up. Yeah? Just a follow up before the PS. So Chairman, before, but he needs to advise on the Finman system, whether or yes, not. Yes, but before the Finman system, before he answer on the Finman system. I accept that there is a policy based on what you have said, um, Section 51 of the FAA Act, which gave the Financial Secretary the authority to instruct or to direct or to guide the process. I am concerned not by that. But I'm concerned based on what the Auditor General said earlier, which says that, um, yes, we will have the, and I'm paraphrasing, we will have the internal auditor do the review. But we are doing a much more substantial review. And without evidence, she had said that it is usually riddled with errors. Errors. There were, there's usually lots of errors. And I, and I said, I'm paraphrasing there. After it comes from the internal audit, which um, have me a bit concerned there, you know, that that is said. I, I, I recall she also said it at no fault of the internal aud auditor, but I am still concerned that it could go to the review of the internal auditor and uh, some of the, these errors are not picked up. All right, AG, can you respond to that? Sure, Mr. Chairman. You need not be concerned, member. The instruction requires the internal auditor to check and verify it does not require the internal auditor to undertake an audit of the appropriation account. So the internal auditor is really checking to ensure that the basic tenets of the appropriation accounts are complied with. That's what the instruction um, indicates. And uh, the DFS for the Ministry of Finance may be aware of the the genesis and the reason why that provision was included in the FAA Act, which is why I say that there needs to be some discussion around it. And thankfully, the member also indicated that I said it is no fault of the internal auditor. It's similar. The member, being an auditor himself, would be aware of 
what is called a limited assurance review, where you're not giving assurance that the financial statements present a true and fair view. You're just saying that I haven't seen anything wrong, but you have not done an in-depth review. So it is not an opinion. It is a review of that sort that the internal auditor is required to undertake. Because as, the, as uh, Mr. Thomas indicated, the internal auditor is expected to do that review before the 31st of July every year and ensure that it is the financial, the appropriation account is submitted to the Ministry of Finance and simultaneously to the, to the Auditor General. Chairman. All right, could you, all right, go ahead, Pierce, and so, then I just want him to answer the other part of the question. No, I, I really want to, there's a, there's a bigger picture, there's a bigger issue that arises out of this conversation that I have struggled with as a permanent secretary and the accounting officer, where the internal audit unit is utilized to do all sorts of different transactions, and I call them transactions, um, And it poses a challenge to me. Pre-audits are another area of great concern for me, where the internal audit unit is required to do pre-audits for gratuity payments, leave calculation, um, all different types of transactions. At sub all the and what it does is that the internal auditor then becomes part of management in terms of the management of a transaction and therefore becomes conflicted because they have to now turn around and then be required to audit this. But they have already participated in the process. So what can they audit? What can they audit? And it's so the issue there is an issue of resource constraints. And, 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 which and is not the, only resource no? constraint, it's, about, it's around the governance of the process and conflict of interest. And so for example this, and I agree with the Auditor General, because we introduce, because Generally speaking, you know, what we have, and it's a problem that I have had for a long time, where because the trust deficit is so high in, pu in the public sector, we layer ourselves with all of these You mean the trust deficit is low? low. Uh, is low. The lack of, of trust, trust is, is high. Is high. Right, right. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. Thank you for the clarity. We layer ourselves with all of these processes. Now, to get a gratuity, and this is a particular problem for the medical officers in the ministry who um, for a lot of times operate on contracts. To get their gratuity paid can take up to six months after they have completed their contract. You know why? In most instances, it has to be audited. It has to be audited. It's a major issue that we need clarification on, and here it is that the Auditor General is expressing that the audit of the appropriation account is just a verification exercise, and it is not an audit exercise, but I guarantee you, I'm not going to put her on the spot, but I guarantee you that she has been doing an audit. Because her interpretation of the instructions coming from um, the Ministry of Finance is that she must do uh, audit of the appropriations account before they are submitted for the Auditor General to do the same thing and, and or the, more. And, and, and Chair, that is why I really want to go back to the Ministry of Finance to, to, to assist us, really, to, to help us to clarify this verifying because the reasonable man and the man on the street is wondering if verifying and auditing and uh, isn't it the same thing? Even a man in, in this house is wondering uh, what is the difference between this verifying and this auditing. So my, the, the, the Ministry of Finance explain, is it an audit, a full-fledged review of the accounts and what is this review or this verifying is for? What is the mischief the, um, the internal auditor being involved in the process is trying to solve? And I would love also 
that uh, the PS question be answered with regards to conflict of interest because I notice that right across ministries and um, department and agencies, the internal auditors are you being used as an extension of management to, um, to, to review the accounts and to check off and, 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 and almost replacing the role of management and the accountant. So I would love those two um, areas to be clarified. Thank you. And also just answer the question about the fin management system as well. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Thomas is going to answer in detail, but just to um, note that where the internal audit function is concerned, the Ministry of Finance does not necessarily support them doing what we call pre-audits. Um, the issue has been over the years that the accounting function we have found sometimes that there are so many errors um, they, they, they are wanting and therefore the internal audit, the management sometimes uses internal audit as quality assurance for the accounting um, function, which is something that needs to be fixed and we, will, we are seeking to address that. I'll ask Mr. Thomas to answer in detail the other issues. All right, so to, to add to what the, um, Davis Blake has said, Hope Blake has said, in terms of the appropriation accounts, when the money, when monies are being expended, it is being expended under the Appropriations Act. It's also being expended with, within the context of the rules uh, within the Financial Administration and Audit Act and also within any other procedural document which would have been issued. Now, a verification of the amount spent must be able to, add to, to provide some form of assurance that what was done from the operational team, operational team meaning the accountants, final accountants, and whoever does the actual recording and reporting of these information, that that process was done uh, in accordance to the guidelines that was set out. Most importantly, whatever has been spent have been spent in accordance with the estimates of expenditure, the Appropriations Act, and that the general process such as uh, certifying, authorizing, uh, and updating, and actually spending accordance, in accordance with what was budgeted for all of that is adhered to. There is no way we can send a statement out of a ministry without the permanent secretary having the confidence that someone outside of the operational um, side of the accounting and reporting is giving some assurance that yes, from an outside view, these, this expenditure is true and fair and it, and it followed the Appropriations Act and any other guidelines, even internal control mechanisms which would have been put in place by the entity. So that's, all, that's what the verification is all about. So by the time it is going to the Auditor General's Department, the Auditor General's Department already has some uh, groundwork to build upon. So that's the initial, that's, that's, that's the reason for that verification process. Now with regards to Finman, Finman is a, a legacy system that we, the government of Jamaica had utilized to do the accounting and reporting for central government entities. The process with regards to the Finman application, if the Finman application should go down, down meaning it's not active for any period of time, then a, a request or a notification should be sent to the Ministry of Finance or the Accountant General's Department, either indicating that the system is not working or whatever complication is, is being uh, experiencing. Now, the ministry should also have a full evidence of this communication that had been 
uh, that have been sent advising of the issues. They should also have uh, documentation showing evidence of the response timelines that the Ministry of Finance or the Accountant General would have taken in, 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 in fixing or, or, or um, getting the issue corrected. So um, in terms of the system being down, whilst at this present moment I am unable to tell you the period for which it has been down or out of service or inactive, Whilst I can't do so now, the Ministry of Health should be in a position to indicate based on the correspondence that would have been used to indicate the times the system have been out, the timelines or duration that it took to, to get the system back up and running. Before I go to Member Guy, Ms. Ms. Blake, I would like for our next meeting, if you could give us an update on the status of appropriation accounts across the various ministries, because I assume this problem wouldn't be specific to the Ministry of Health, and whether the same issues related to Finman are being experienced by other ministries, and really how we plan to address it. I mean, there's clearly an issue of availability of personnel and the ability to attract personnel at the current salary levels, but it's something that we have to look at. But, Member Guy? Chair, you open the door to my question because the question that I wanted to ask, and Ms. Blake, you may put this as your to-do list as well. Um, how many other ministries have been affected by this um, breakdown in the system, and have they had the same challenges as the Minister of Health and Wellness? AG, go ahead. That information is available in the annual reports, Mr. Chairman, and I'll just take you through very quickly. As at December 2022, that was our cutoff. The Ministry of National Security has two years outstanding, 2020 to 2021. And this is at December because they may have submitted their appropriation accounts since then. The police department has three years outstanding. Department of Correctional Services, three. Institute of Forensic Science and Legal Medicine, five. Ministry of Justice, one. Resident Magistrates, Parish Courts, two. Supreme Court, two. And let me just give a rider here because the appropriation accounts are independent each, for each year. So the years outstanding for the Resident Magistrates Court and the Supreme Court is actually 1314 and 1516, which suggests that they had some issues with those years. Trustee in bankruptcy, 1415 to 1718, four years. Ju the judiciary, one year. Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, two years. Ministry of Labor and Social Security, the recurrent, four years. The capital B, two years. Capital C, three years. Ministry of Education, eight years for recurrent. For capital A, six years. For capital B, six years. Ministry of Education, Youth, for recurrent, capital C, two years. Child Protection Family Service, two years. Ministry of Health, nine years for recurrent. For capital A, three years. For capital B, four years. And for capital C, three years. Bellevue Hospital, four years. Government Chemist, Six, year, six years. Ministry of Culture, Gender and Entertainment, one year. Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries, four years. For capital A, B and C, three years. Ministry of Agriculture, 5,000, head 5,000, two years. And uh, two years as well for 5,000 um, C. Ministry of Industry and Commerce, four years. For recurrent, for capital A, three years. Ministry of Industry and Investment and Commerce, four years. The Company's Office of Jamaica, nine years, but I'll clarify. The, the executive agencies are required to prepare financial statements, but based on the provision of law, they are also required to prepare appropriation accounts as well. So some 
So the, uh, the financial statements are more up to date. There's a, they, they, I know that the company's office is, is in arrears probably by two, three years. Nothing as significant as the appropriation accounts. But it's a requirement on law that you do two sets for some agencies. Uh, Ministry of Science, MSET, one year in all three instances. And that's the state of affairs, Mr. Chairman. I, I was trying to draw a conclusion, and I, I don't know if I'm correct, whether the bigger, mini, the bigger spending ministries that have larger budgets seem to have the greater difficulties in um, clearing their areas. I don't know if that's a correct conclusion based on what you have said, but it is clearly a problem across the board which requires some intervention for us to bring those accounts up to date because we'd be talking about significant billions of dollars that we would have no appropriation accounts for. Member Sibley's. Thank you, Chair. I um, want to really go back to this appropriation, appropriation account being in arrears to be audited. Whilst I am not able to state specifically for all those ministries, departments, and agencies that the Auditor General had just um, stated, with regard to the Ministry of Health, I would like to, to speak to that, and maybe it will speak to the others. If we have the internal auditors doing an audit because it is clearly based on what was explained by the Ministry of Finance. It is an audit. In fact, the representative of the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Thomas, said that it is in aid to, to state whether or not there is a true and fair presentation of the financials. That is an audit. And what happened when we have two entities of government auditing the same books? You'll find that the accountants and all the persons who are working in the entity, all they do all year long is to respond to auditors. And it also affects the productivity of our government, ministries, department, and agencies. And it is my recommendation that we look at it because I don't see the need to have two, one set of books being audited by two sets of auditors. It just is just not efficient. And to say that the agencies who are to, to prepare financial statements to be audited by maybe private external auditors also have to prepare appropriation accounts, some of them. That's, again, to my mind, is, is duplication. And we, as a country, cannot continue down this road because it, it will affect productivity. See here, we have nine years of appropriation accounts not reaching the Auditor General because they are being audited to be audited again. That doesn't make sense to my mind. All right, Member Guy, and then I want to close on this Chairman, part of the just a very quick question, and I don't know if it's Mrs. Blake or the Auditor General will answer this. Is there a sanction imposed on the officers, the accounting officers, in the ministries for this delinquency? Mr. Thomas can respond to that. Uh, 
And if there is, why is it not being utilized? Oh. Yes, so the question, are there actions for um, the lack of presentation of financial statements appropriation accounts? And the answer to that is there is uh, um, disciplinary actions that have, been that have been stated in the financial instructions. It puts the response, it outlines the responsibility of a permanent secretary to ensure that reports are submitted uh, and in, on, a, in, on a timely basis as provided for in the Act. It also provides that where these uh, reports are not submitted on time, that the Ministry is issued with notification or, for lack of a better word, warning that the reports are due and uh, he or she should ensure that it is outlined to the Ministry of Finance as to the process that um, is being undertaken by the Ministry in order to get these statements out. Now, based on the reasoning, it is the, by the discretionary, discretion of the Financial Secretary to, under advisement, to, asset, to assess whether the reasons given is a, a justified reason for the lateness. Now, just jumping ahead to say that a sanction, it's not, it's really from a disciplinary um, perspective. It goes as far as to uh, shifting of the accounting officer to another area, another ministry, if the portfolio, it is deemed that the portfolio is not being uh, uh, managed accordingly. But just to say it is a process it is a process um, to similar to how a surcharge matter goes Mr. through Thomas, a process. That is like a musical chair. Uh, but <laughs> Chairman, I am concerned. I, I, I am concerned that the Ministry of Finance would intimate in this House that the Financial Secretary has the ability to impose disciplinary action outside of surcharge on a permanent secretary. I. I would like the Ministry of Finance to point out, and this is for governance issues, we must be very careful, we are a rule of law. Where in the Financial FAA Act gives the Financial Secretary the ability to sanction by way of disciplinary action a permanent secretary? Are you, all right. Do you so, want to, let me, let me hold on that. You want to go and make sure you do the research and come back to the house with an answer. I understand your concern, P.S., but um, I don't want to, I want to ensure that we have accurate information in the public domain. So, Ms. Blake and Mr. Thomas, come back to us with that specific thing. I don't want any inaccurate information. Um, I understand Member Holness, who is online, has a question. Member Holness? Member Holness? All right, we'll, we'll come back. Um, to I don't know why my mind just went okay. off. Sorry about that, Chair. Through you, Chair. I wanted to have an appreciation of where we are, say, comparatively, if we take, I don't know if it's too much for the AG to be able to give us this information, looking at the MBAs and what was their state of readiness in terms of provisions of their appropriations account and financials say, 10 years ago, and what it is like to be just to see by ministry, agency, and department, who are the ones who are more up-to-date, who are improving, and where we're actually having issues. So we can identify if everybody is improving or if there are particular ministries or agencies that have been consistently derelict and they're not improving. I would agree with the PS as well because one would also have to go further in assessing the resources that have been budgeted for the various ministries. What is the competence that exists within the ministries to be able to meet the timelines um, coming forward from year to year? As it relates to internal audit, I must agree with member siblings as well, because more effort needs to be placed in strengthening the internal audit apparatus of the ministries, agencies, and departments, so that we are not relying on only the AG's department, which one would expect has to rotate and would not be able to sit in our various ministries, 
agencies and departments, particularly those with large budgets, in ensuring that their accounting is accurate and up-to-date. AG, I don't know if you can, I don't think you would have the information here, but could you commit based on the question asked by Member Holness, is that data you could come back to us with? Mr. Chairman, what I would do is just, this information is included in the annual report every year. And so you will see the trend year to year um, based on the annual report. And I'm just relying now on my memory um, after assuming the position as Auditor General that there were four ministries that historically we had issues with. That was Ministry of National um, Security, Ministry of Labor and Social Security, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health. Ministry of National Security, I think, has done a commendable job in bringing their accounts up to, up to date. The Ministry of Labor and Social Security, that has been a perennial problem, that not just with the submission of the statements, because you see, the problem starts for us when we actually get the statements. Um, the experience is that there, there, there are generally several iterations of the appropriation accounts um, for varying reasons. And so, in, I, just reflecting on one ministry, the audit spans, uh, and I shouldn't say the audit, but the process spans more than two years, not because the audit has taken that long, but the entities, the ministries often take a lot, inordinate length of time to address the issues identified and to correct the statements. The suggestion made by the permanent secretary is one that I think we should not ignore, and that is the strength, the institutional strength of the finance units within the, the ministries that uh, may be um, contributing to the problem, which is why I say that the time spent with the internal auditor is, may not add significant value because, re and it's not um, a result of any lack of ability of the internal auditor, it's just the difference in the review. And you will find that we have to go through several um, iterations with the accounts unit. So I, 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 I heard, and this is the reason why I mentioned it, because it seemed to me the position initially, um, PS, was that the delay is due to the internal auditor. Well, I'm asking why is it with the internal auditor, but I do not believe that it is the internal auditor that is really contributing, but the challenges with those statements. And so even when the internal auditor um, reviews it, when it comes to us, there are issues that's going to result. Because if the internal auditor reviews it for three months and we're forming an opinion, now I'm going to sign off on it, you can just imagine what I am going to expect before I can sign off to say that these statements are correct. So I think we have to increase the efficiency, DFS, Blake, of that process because it is contributing to it. But I also believe that the strength of the accounts units within the MDAs must um, also be considered as a part of addressing this problem. All right, thank you. I'm going to shift gears and move to the COVID expenditure. And one of the big issues flagged by the Auditor General is the absence of contracts in place for quarantine facilities and other services that were provided, um, infrastructure works, etc. I know the PS has a major difference of opinion in relation to the Auditor General on this issue. What I would ask you, P.S., we, we all know the context of the time and the, 
the need for the ministry to act quickly to put these systems in place so that, so that persons could be housed, etc. The question is why weren't these the contracts, even if you had to move emergency contracting, why wouldn't you put contracts in place even after that? Chair, could they Sorry. also have a rider to that? Yes. And it may be both the AG and the PS. The PS in the statement given to us said they does not accept this finding. And the Auditor General says on a particular section of the Public Procurement Act um, that it is so in terms of hotel room procurement. Can we, as the committee, get what is the, the, the law? So thank you very much, Chairman. Um, so that is the government of the <coughs> Chair, sorry, that is the government of the ministry's position. As we cited um, at the beginning of this conversation, it's about the law. So again, we reference section 25. And I ask a question in reviewing this document on this first finding, which law are we utilizing to formulate the issue of compliance. And I wasn't sure, it wasn't, it, wasn't rep, it wasn't said in the report. In the report, it says, um, give me a second. So the page that I am referencing in the report, there are several references in the report that speaks to it. So uh, on page 11, it says, early and proactive approach to activated emergency protocols. Um, in terms of when we look at the, on page 12, we hear um, the arrangements in its emergency spending related to COVID in responding to the pandemic. Right throughout the report, there is a mention of, on page 17, procurement guidelines. Um, so our position is that on the the relevant sections of the procurement at section four of the first schedule, paragraph one, I, travel services and hotel accommodations are exempt from procurement. So if the compliance issue, because remember now, we must reference the particular rule, the particular regulation, the particular law that the compliance standard is being applied to. And so we weren't sure which compliance standard was being applied when we arrived at this finding. So we want clarity on that. So if you could just provide us with that clarity. Go ahead, AG. Mr. Chairman, before I address that, I'm just going to repeat something that I said earlier. The audit was undertaken in May 2020. The lockdown started March 2020. The aim of the audit was to provide guidance as well as to identify any missteps to give the Ministry of Health and other ministries as well an opportunity to address the, 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 the concerns or the deficiencies highlighted. So it really wasn't meant to be a debate, Mr. Chairman. We're talking about stewardship of uh, public monies and resources. So the permanent secretary apparently at the heart of this issue is that the expenditure of 619 million does not fall under the procurement guidelines because they rented hotel facilities. Mr. Chairman, I hold a different view. Because what I recall is that during that time, the hotels were closed. And what the government did was to rent the space to host persons who are quarantined. It's facilities, nobody was sent on a weekend trip. It's facilities. No, I, I hear what the permanent secretary is saying, his view. But the aim of this audit is to ensure that there is transparency in the process, the tenets of transparency and accountability is upheld. Let me, I'm, I'm not done. So he's relying on a purchase order. The purchase order, as he says, and I'm going to ask the Minister of Finance to uh, actually clarify their position on this. He says can be used as a contract. That's not in debate either. But there are certain tenets that must be present. So if it is going to be used as a contract, 
the terms of agreement must be clearly stipulated to hold the supplier accountable and to protect the government. The purchase orders which I have included for the committee members to see contains absolutely nothing that would amount to a contract. In fact, the ministry used the purchase order as payment vouchers. When you look, that's not how a purchase order is supposed to be utilized. The purchase order is to set out very clearly the specifications of the goods being procured or the terms of agreement of the services being procured. It did not say that, Mr. Chairman. Another thing we noted is that a purchase order really ought to come before the process and signed off on. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the purchase order was actually prepared after the invoice. The purchase order was prepared and used as the payment voucher to execute the payment. So what did we want to know? Having made these payments, because the, your, and what we saw as well is that the payment voucher, the invoice is on the same date, and the payment is being made for hotel rooms not yet occupied, but it is stamped that goods delivered in sati um, satisfactorily. Those are the issues, Permanent Secretary. The fact is, too, the Permanent Secretary, because he is hell-bent on holding on to this thing about purchase order, has not actually provided any evidence that he was able to satisfy himself that all the rooms were occupied. That is what we were asking for. We, it's not intended for it to be a debate. It is a debate. No, no, no. It is a debate because Chairman, I disagree. If allow me I to disagree. Hold on, I disagree hold with Dr. General. Hold yes. on, yes. Hello, yes. hello. No, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I asked. <laughs> Just allow the Auditor General. So, let yes. Yeah, because I want to make my position clear on this. If the permanent secretary is going to debate, mm -hmm. I don't think the permanent secretary should be debating with me. The permanent secretary should be debating with the Ministry of Finance and I believe the Public Service Commission. Because all permanent secretaries have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that government funds are expended with the high regard for the rules and regulations that are established established to govern such expenditure. I'm not going to have no quarrel with the permanent secretary here. So I know he has whatever he has to say, but Mr. Chairman, my position is and, it, it, it is and will remain until the permanent secretary can provide more than an argument that these funds were spent with due regard for the proper governance system and the ministry in fact received value for money for them. That is the crux of the matter, Mr. Chairman. The permanent secretary has put forward his arguments, but he has not put forward any evidence. It is, uh, not, for ahead, me, it is not for me to put forward evidence. The Auditor General has prepared a report, and the report is to go be governed by the law. What, I ask a simple question, what rule, what regulation arrives at the finding? Just give me that, and then I will refer to that rule and regulation. The Auditor General is not at large. Her opinion or her ruminations do not bind me. The law binds me. And as a, as a matter of fact, until the Auditor General can provide in law under Section 25 of the, of, of the, of the Act, which I preceded this conversation by, what rule the compliance audit finding was predicated on, I have no obligation none in law to adhere to any finding that is not predicated in law. None. And therefore, the Auditor General is obligated in law to state to me as accounting officer, duly authorized in the same act that she has, provide, that, that she has her authority, the FAA Act, to give that assurance. What law? What law? have I breached? What guideline have I breached? In terms of the Auditor General's report, she pointed out that the, I have not satisfied myself. It is without context that Auditor General, and this is what is wrong with this report, there is no context. The report is less than useful. Less than useful. 
It's a less than useful report because it has no context. The report is not a report in and of itself. It is supposed to serve a purpose of good governance. I am supposed to go away from this meeting and do something to change, to improve the governance structure and institutional arrangement within my ministry. Without the rule of law, it means nothing. Which law did I breach? She made the point of the issue of the, huh? if any. It, the, she made the point around the, the, the issuing of purchase orders for hotel accommodation. In the report, she cites on numerous occasions, she utilized procurement legislation as the source of her. It is incorrect. It is a wrong law because proc um, the Procurement Act does not apply. Therefore, the substance of her compliance is incorrect. It should be withdrawn. It is not a finding. The reality is, Chairman, that at the time of the audit, at the time of the transaction, we did not know how many rooms we were, going to, uh, we were going to utilize. We did not know. What we agreed with the firm or with the company was the fact that we needed rooms to be made available for us to house persons who were in households that had high risk factors because they had people there with, who are elderly, with diabetes, hypertension, and we need to move them out. There was a particular call center where at the time when we needed to move out nearly 450 members of that call center because they were living in households that had high density with high risk factors, and we had to move quickly. We did not know how many rooms we would win. What we agreed on was a rate, a substantially reduced rate. What the hotels told us is that in order to start up their plant, they needed an advance because they had to turn on their air conditioning unit, they had to recall their staff, they had to do all of those things, and so they required of us, as part of their collaboration, the, the advance. We agreed to the advance, and we paid the advance with due regard for the risks associated. What is egregious around this report is that this, this report robs the 23,000 members of the health system, the benefit of understanding their role and function in protecting this country against a very, very disaster, a possible disaster. This report serves this finding. I shouldn't say the report. Give a pardon. This finding is less than useful. Um, Chairman, chair. Chairman on, on, as I said, as I said before, which law? Just answer me which law. And if there is a law that I have reached, tell me, and I will, and I will right. act accordingly. All right. I know there are, I, we're not going to get agreement. I know the PS has a strong view. The Auditor General has a strong view. Mrs. Blake, I'm going to ask the Ministry of Finance for guidance here. I don't think you can answer me now, but it is important that we clarify this going forward. I, I've heard both perspectives. I would say as chairman of the PAC, I understand the context we are in. I'm not oblivious to that. And I understand the need for the ministry at the time to have moved quickly. There were a number of moving parts. There were a number of uncertainties there. So that I do understand. What I would say, though, is having made the initial agreements to get things started, why after wasn't there an attempt to formalize these agreements to ensure that the issue of value for money, to ensure that the commitments that were made were done? That is the concern. Uh, uh, I mean, what is not a must? No, no, I, no, no, I have asked a question. You may not agree with my question, but I have asked a question. And I have member Guy Cousins, then I'll take um, member Miller and Sibley's. Um, um, thank you, Chair. Um, P.S., I understand your passion, especially the last part, but I have a little difficulty with that. Um, and I'm not taking sides. I'm just listening to the argument. The fact that you indicated that this report or this aspect of report robbed the 23,000 healthcare facility um, providers, I think that was a little... No, uh, sir. It was, because the truth is that 
my understanding of the report and what the AG just said a while ago was not that you could not have done what you did in getting the rooms for all these persons and the, the clients who had to be relocated from elsewhere, but it was the process. That's all. And I don't think to suggest, as you did, that it robbed, and that's a very strong word, you know, in terms of how it was used and in the context it was used. So I think you, you, you should have a little um, discussion on that. Absolutely not, member. Absolutely not. I have to face these members of the team, sir. I have to, and when this report was tabled, I had to face my team and the deep sense of loss that they felt coming out of this report being tabled in this, in this parliament, in the way that it was tabled. I am passionate about it and I have no apology for my passion, member. Chairman, I have no apology for my passion. We lived, this team sitting behind me, lived COVID. Hours, hours, hours. The chief medical officer, the principal financial, the chief technical directors, we lived COVID. And for us, and I often tell my team that be careful of the crowd that comes on Palm Sunday. They come back on Good Friday. They come back. However, another member of the team remind me that there's also an Easter Sunday morning. The fact of the matter, Chairman. There was of us who went to Sunday school would understand what you said. Right. The, the fact Sabbath of school. the matter, Chairman, is that this report is a compliance audit. This report is a compliance audit. A compliance audit, by definition, must speak to standards and which standard you are applying in arriving at a finding. It must. It must. And therefore, I have to ask the question, if you are going to launch a statement, in, and not only did you launch a statement, you doubled down in an addendum to reiterate your point, and the finding itself was so offensive in its language. Management of funds allocated for public health response in COVID-19. And then you say, lack transparency. What? I reject that on behalf of all of us. I reject it. We managed COVID. We managed it. And we will not allow any report produced by any member of the government, uh, 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 of, the, um, of the bureaucracy to undermine that effort. I reject that finding and I retain that I reject the finding. And if it is not in law, I am not obligated to hear the ruminations of the Auditor General. All right. P.S. I hear you. I, I'm going to Member Cousins, Member Miller, Member Sippis, and I, I want you to come back to the question I asked while understanding the context and how you had to operate in and the emergency nature of these arrangements, fully understanding those, why after weren't those things formalized? Member Cousins. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, P.S., uh, <clears throat> I hear you. Um, the, the issue is not one of COVID-19, because all of us live through COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All of us live through the pandemic. Um, the greater issue is the fact that all monies expended during the pandemic belong to the people of Jamaica. Hard-working people who pay them taxes. It's not your money, and it's not my money. It's not ours to spend as we we, we wish. And that is why we have systems in place. Right? And so when I look at, for example, the report, and I, you see, we, we understand the constraints and the environment you know, under which you are operating. And we know that it was rough for every single soul. Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is ensure that when we're spending the money, we follow the, we have, we have a fiduciary obligation. No, sir. M member, sorry to interject. You say we must follow the. 
the when rules. we are spending the money, we must follow the rule. Yes, thank Which you. rule did I did not? No, Which man, rule I, I am not did saying, I not I, follow? No, no. Mm. Respect. Uh, maybe you have found a lacuna, and that's where I'm going. A because, lacuna? because you have mentioned earlier that as it relates to the hotel spending, that's the issue that I'm having now, you know, mm. that, that you would not have breached any procurement rules because that's exempted. That is what you're saying. I am saying that if you look at that interpretation, that would mean that you could send the entire ministry at any time. Absolutely. And I leave in a hotel, and there would be no answer, you would not be answerable to anybody. But that it is absurd. No, we are mean doing no, 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 no one, members. One, one I, am, I am on the floor, man. Allow, Look at that, man. One second, gentlemen. Let's allow member cousins to ask his question. You you have an opportunity to respond, but allow him to ask his question. Allow his. Go ahead, member cousins. Thank you, Chairman. No, but I am saying, you know, that perhaps the PS has found a lacuna that we, as legislators, need to plug. You're not a legislator, obviously you're not. Um, but the reality of PS is that if, I, if, if we are going to take what you're saying in terms of the exemption, right, and you look at the amount of money spent, I mean, yes, we're operating under constraints, but what if we were to apply that? tomorrow morning um, to just send staff on vacation leave to a hotel. How, do, how would you interpret that? How would it look? The interpretation of it is, of it is a bit absurd in my opinion. And I, I, I think really we need some clarification mm. because we are, this is a dangerous road that we're treading down. It is very dangerous because if as peace you can look at a particular and I'm not faulting your, your interpretation yes, of it, but it is a very dangerous interpretation that you're applying to that particular provision. My opinion. Chairman? Uh, yeah, yes, and then I, I go to the Auditor General. Mem mem member, member, I have not applied any interpretation. No, I have not applied any interpretation. All I have done is, under the FAA Act, utilized my abilities, my, the authorities that have been given to me all I, have, all I am asking is what regulation, what rule, it's a compliance audit. What did I not comply with? And it cannot be that the opinion of the Auditor General is that I should have, because that's a management questioning of my management. Of, of my management. And I am saying, if the Auditor General is going to question my management, she has to question my management in the context of the law. We're all bound by the law. What law? I just need to be advised. I'm not saying that this is incorrect. Tell me which law. All right, Madam Auditor General. Turn on your mic, turn on your mic. The Permanent Secretary is being measured against Section 53 of the financial regulations which require accounting officers to agree on the terms and conditions for provision of service prior to implementation. That's the point I made. Because he's insisting on using the purchase order, but the purchase orders were not even completed properly. So they do not meet the standards of the, the, the regulations. So even if he wants to rely on the purchase orders mm -hmm. as, um, as, a co for, as a contract, the document which he's relying on was not completed properly. It was used as a payment voucher. But Mr. Chairman, I want to emphasize something. This is the third time I'm going to say it. The audit was undertaken in June 2020. The majority of these transactions were not finalized. So after bringing this matter to the permanent secretary's attention, he continued to pursue, he did not even consult the Ministry of Finance as far as I'm concerned for clarification because if he did, he would have gotten it. He pursued it and spent over $300 million more using the same method. I Despite, and, and I want to say, Mr. Chairman, because the permanent secretary, he, what he's doing as far as I'm concerned is trying to muddy the waters and not address the issue. 
the, ish, the information that we found and presented about these um, the arrangements, it was not in one document. It was in emails between the Ministry of Health um, staff and the owners of the establishment. And I, I, see, I, I saw documents that the permanent secretary just signed off and said, proceed. And I'm wondering if he actually read it. I... I don't, uh, uh, Chairman, Madam Auditor General, you see, you one see second. Where, you see where this is going, Madam Chairman. Auditor, one second, all all one second, please. <laughs> one no, second. no, Chairman. Madam, no, no, hold Chairman, on, no. Chairman, Allow I me, must please. protest. Madam, I must ma protest. Madam Auditor General, I, I don't, I don't want I you to must make. Protest. Yes, I allow me, please. Okay. Allow me, Madam Auditor General. I don't want you to speculate or draw any references. You are doing fine until the last okay, so I, sentence. I will withdraw, uh, uh, withdraw that speculation, that, please. Mr. Chairman. Please, please, without please. Without any issue. Please, please, please. <laughs> All right. I have an order here. Member Miller, Member Holness is online, uh, Member City is Member Clark. Thank you, sir, Chair. I'd like to ask, you know, I'd like to place on record thanks to your team for what you have done for the COVID-19. Thank you, I sir. myself, I was scared. You know, I, I think the ministry did a wonderful job where that is concerned. And, you know, it's easier for us to say stuff because we're not in the front line to really treat some of these issues. So I, I'd like to ask some pointed questions. What were the time frame that your ministry had to work with to house these persons in these institutions? So thank you very much, member. I, I, you know, hindsight is 2020, and sometimes we question these things without understanding context. And again, I come back to context because the report is devoid of context. The first instance that we had to um, engage with what um, a hotel, if you recall, was I believe in June, was it CMO, when the persons were on the ship. Yes. And the cruise company had sent the ship with, the, with, with Jamaicans on it. The ship was in harbor, don't hold me to the time, was on a Wednesday. And there was a meeting that was held with the subcommittee of cabinet. And the instruction was given on the Thursday or the Friday that the persons must be housed by Sunday. So we had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to put in place all the logistics around the housing of persons. We began to call some of the hotels, and most of them said it is too expensive to restart their operation, and two, they were unwilling to take the reputational risk of housing, per because at that time, there were persons who were deathly afraid of what COVID represented and meant. In our canvassing of all of the hotels, one hotel said they would have a conversation with their headquarters in Spain to see whether or not they could help us. And they said, if when they came back to us at about 1 a.m. the next morning, and we had to have the meetings with them at that time, they indicated to us that in order for them to do this, they had to start up their machinery, they had to recall staff, and we had to put in place an entire elaborate protocol around training of staff, allowing persons to manage infection prevention and control procedures, um, it was a massive operation, moving the people from off the ship, triaging them, putting them in um, the facilities, doing the tests, the COVID tests, ensuring that, and all of that had to be done within 48 hours. Once we came to an agreement with the, with the company, we moved immediately to execute the, execute the contract, because I contend, and the Auditor General says I did not refer, I have a E an email from the Ministry of Finance that justifies that a purchase order is a contract. 
So, so what I'm getting from you, Pierce, I've heard both Can you, sides. one second, remember me, though. Can you, you said you have correspondence from I the minister. I do. Can you read that, please? So, the correspondence is from the Ministry of Finance, and it says, it relates to the payment of public... F the date on this correspondence is April 6, 2021. This is after it was raised by the Auditor General's Department. Is as it relates to the payment of public funds, the financial instructions 5.7.2 certification and approval should provide guidance. A purchase order is a binding agreement between the vendor and the MDA, which is Ministry, Department, and Agency. Hence, for the judge's purposes, it is a form of contract. If a contract already is, exists, then the purchase order, a secondary contract, will not be necessary. See the extract below for ease of reference. And the extract represents 5.7.2, certification and approval. And it says, no payment of public money shall be made as unless authorized by law or by resolution. And, there, and, and that was what? Ooh, ooh, ooh. You, you, you were the one that sent the, the requested... I requested the and information. Who respo and who the respond Ministry for the Finance. record? Who is at the Ministry of Finance responding? That is... Member, I, 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 <laughs> I can't... It was Mr. Thomas who... Yes, because we are, we, we are reading things into the record. Right, no, it's important to note where the response so came the from. Mr. So, so Mr. Mr. Thomas Barrington Thomas respond. is from the PXPC. No. Okay. If Thanks. there is a... If there is a interpretation issue around the opinion of the minister, Ministry of Finance, the accounting, I have no, I have no local standard in that. Between the accountant, um, the Auditor General, and the Ministry of Finance, I have, I have my interpretation of my abilities under the FAA Act coincides with my, the interpretation of the Ministry of Finance at the time. The Ministry of Finance is now having a different opinion. I don't know. But at the time, this is a certification that I have received. All right, the AG, I'm coming back to you, Member Miller. But Thank, you. Ahead, AG. Thank you, Chairman. The PS speaks about context, and it's important to give context. An officer of the Ministry of Health wrote to the, via email to the Ministry of Finance on April 3rd. 2021, and it reads, recaptioned, I have a question for a representative from the IMU Department of the Accountant General. It is as follows. I have contracts for different classification of workers that are scheduled for operations at the vaccination site at the National Arena for the Blitz program. Do the payments for these personnel need a purchase order? I.e., can the payments be made against only the commitment voucher? On the 6th of April, Mr. Barrington Thomas responded. He responded to an email that said they had contracts. Do they need a purchase order? And you know what the response is. The permanent secretary read it for you. The permanent secretary did not write to the Ministry of Finance asking whether purchase orders can be used instead of contracts for the vaccination, uh, for the uh, quarantine uh, facilities. I, I, In fact, they gave the Ministry of Finance the impression that contracts existed. No, no. This is what the permanent secretary... I have to come back to this, you know, Mr. Chairman, because it's coming back to a determination. All of this was discussed in between May and June 2022. We're now in April 2023. The ministry entered into many such transactions after. And we're still... We're debating one point. Yes. Whether there is a purchase order. But, Mr. Chairman, my issue is whether the ministry can provide evidence. Because when we asked for it, to provide the evidence that all the rooms were occupied, we could not get that. But no, you another would not get thing, that. Another thing, Mr. Chairman, the report itself acknowledges that. Yes, 
we recognize that it was in fact an emergency. No, it's not performance. I'm, I'm also passionate. I'm also passionate. No, man, let's allow the AG to. Yes. So we recognize that, Mr. Chairman. The, the ministry had time to correct it even to consult with and get further clarification from the ministry. The recommendation, Mr. Chairman, in this report is not to hold the permanent secretary accountable. I didn't recommend referring him to the Office of the Services Commission to the financial secretary. The recommendation was that the permanent secretary and other accounting officers should use the lessons learned from this to improve the processes going forward. I, I, that was the recommendation because it is my opinion, it is my opinion that the transaction does not fall within the provision of rental of um, hotel rooms as intended by. That is my Chairman, opinion. I no. also took into consideration because generally when you are um, rent um procuring or renting um hotel rooms the, the amounts involved probably would be about two million it's not anything significant and so i can understand the provisions yep. this we're talking about 619 million dollars and what i have done this is not 619 million in totality i excluded the sums paid to the hotel for which they had a contract with so i don't want the impression to be given that there was no formal agreement because i mentioned that in the report that there was a contract for one such um facility and even that contract could have been used no, as a template no, it could not. for the others absolutely all right, all right, hold one not. second for me <laughs> we have we have mr thomas here who seemed to have responded to both queries we have miss blake i would like your opinion your view the view of the ministry of finance as it stands now on this particular issue given everything that we have heard from both the permanent secretary and the Auditor General. What is the view of the Ministry of Finance on issues related to accommodation, purchase order, contracts, etc.? Yeah. Uh, Chairman, um, the procurement guidelines, the procurement law, actually exempts, as um, the Permanent Secretary had indicated in the first schedule. Uh, it, it talks about rental of the hotel rooms that is exempt. However, I do not want us to miss the fact there is, it is true that the purchase order creates a contract for delivery or supply of service. However, you want to make sure that you protect the government as much as possible. So even where there is a purchase order, we would expect that there are conditions of service and that the government can be protected in, in case there is a legal matter that the government is protected. And that is what we are mostly interested in. Mr. Thomas? Okay. Differ. So, Chairman, here it is, the, the, the critical point. All of us manage risks. The Auditor General, in hindsight, can tell me about administrative risks. At the time when I was acting, I was not managing administrative risks. I was managing the risk of life. And therefore, I stand behind the actions of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. I stand behind the decisions that we made to protect this country. I stand behind my colleagues, all of them, for the work that we done, we have done, and again I ask, which law? And if it is that Auditor General is citing a law that obviously, as the Deputy Financial Secretary has thus pointed out, the, the purchase order represents a contract, this is not a breach. This is not, a, a, there is no way that she can cite me for our finding that is not represented in law. All that rep this represents, as I said before, is a rumination of the Auditor General. The report is not a report in and of itself. 
The report is supposed to be guideposts for me to improve. If I have rejected this, it is not a finding and she cannot bind me to it. What now? What now? All right. Well, what I would, I'm coming back to Member Miller. I, I understand the context of how you operated. What I've heard what the Ministry of Finance said, they have also indicated what best practice should be. So if you are asking what should be the lessons learned, they are, I think they have indicated what those are, which is that, yes, you started with a purchase order, but the best practice should be a contract. But they, no, that, that's what I heard Ms. Blake say, no. right? So if you're, no, you have said you, there, there's nothing from the report that you can take forward. I'm saying the guidance from the report is you were in emergency circumstances. You were managing lives, not administrative risks, but best practice going forward, purchase order, but then contract. That's what I've heard from the so Minister Chairman, of So, Chairman, you're saying to me that going forward, if we should have to manage an, a pandemic of a different sort and we have to take similar actions, I must... Let me put in context. You see, when I talk about contracts... The very mention of the contract says, okay, this no longer, ha you can't have a conversation with me anymore. We must go to Mexico or we must go to Spain and the lawyers in Spain and Mexico would have to opine. But, but yes, but, you had no, a contract but, but in chairman, place but in chairman, no, But chairman, I don't think that we are being fair. We are not being fair. The reality here is that a purchase order, Chairman, is a contract. And under the FAA Act, the relevant sections of the FAA Act, I met the obligation of the FAA Act, as pointed out in the previous, in the, the 5.7.2. If I have met the obligations of the FAA Act, why would I, in an emergency, apply more bureaucracy? Why would I do that? Now, the Auditor General has pointed out that I cannot guarantee how many rooms were utilized because I cannot. What I decided to do was to block because we did not have numbers and we, were, we had to give the field the operational scope to intervene in communities and have the ability to absorb people and release people. There were some people who were in those isolation places for a month, one month, because you remember, as you pointed out, Chairman, if you did not get that second um, negative test, you could not be released from isolation. And some people went for their first, um, what do you call it, test, and they got a positive. They went for the second one. They got a negative, but when they get back, it comes back positive. And, it, and for mo uh, one person stayed in isolation for six weeks. Six weeks. We are missing context. We're missing context, and that is the problem here. You know what the other problem is, um, Chairman? The, the, the fact of the matter is, and it's a problem that I have with the Auditor General in general, the department, not the individual. It's the department I'm talking about. The majority of our funds are expended in the region. Nothing in the report about the utilization of resources at the operational level. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, in the implementation of this COVID response, introduced a new incentive called the COVID incentive. Approximately $4 billion of the monies that we received was, ex was expended in the COVID um, incentive. And it's an incentive, it's about $6,000 per day? $3,000 per day paid to everyone who had to interact with COVID any at all. If you had to carry samples, you got it. If you're sweeping the floor, you got it. If you had to deal with patients, you got it. From a risk-based analysis, how were those incentives utilized? 
There is nothing in the report about it. Nothing. That would have been useful to me. Because there was heated debate in the Ministry of, of Health as to whether or not we should introduce this incentive. But I was faced with the reality that many persons were deathly afraid of working in the environment. And how would I create that environment that, that encouraged people, that incentivized people to work in the environment? And we introduced, and the technical team was very cautious about it. Was it implemented effectively? Who got it? Did they get it in accordance with the provisions that we outlined? Was it done effectively and efficiently? Not a word. It sounds like you're recommending a follow-up audit on I, that day. I am. I am. <laughs> okay. Because I, hey, I, I don't think you understand, Chairman, that audits are critical to good governance and management. I support, ask my audit, internal auditor. I support audit. I stand behind them. Because I can't see it's $113 billion that I have to expend this year. If without audits, I am blind. This audit, Chairman, I contend, was subpar. All right, I've heard you. Um, member Holen has been holding for a while. Let me just invite her. You're not, you're not I'm finished. Chairman. Yet. I, I really do not know that I necessarily need to ask any of the questions again. I think I got a lot of clarity both from the AG and to a great extent uh, as well from the permanent secretary. I understand that the situation was one of emergency. Um, what I was still having a challenge with was the time frame in which we identified and stated to the Minister of Health the concerns we had in how we were procuring something which was unusual, the hotel spaces we needed at the time, and whether or not it was still being said after all the clarification was brought that there was still an issue. I hear the permanent secretary very well indicating that we also have to ensure even in cases that we have found emergencies, one of the takeaway being what we do in adjusting the rules, the laws that govern these issues so that persons are not in a position that they can rely on nothing specifically being in place that holds them accountable to follow a procedure in an exact way because once we are in any situation that even if emergency and we are doing an, a preliminary review, which I'm appreciative that the agency department did, we should, along with Minister of Finance, be absolutely more solid and direct in what we are instructing that the permanent secretary and his or her team is required to do in compliance going forward forward. All right. Thank you, Member Hulness. Member Miller, you say you weren't finished. Thank okay. you, sir, Chair. I've gotten some clarity from, for some of the questions that I wanted to ask, but I want to follow up on the question that I asked P.S. and to ask you personally as the account. In your point of view, P.S., you said that you discuss on a reduced rate with the hotels, right? In your point of view, do you believe that you got value for money? One. And two, I'll ask either finance or the AG office, were there any misappropriation of funds from the entire exercise that you undertook? At the ministry. What was the negotiated rate again? It was $1,200? So thank you very much for that question, uh, member. So 
we engaged several facilities um, at different rates. The rates that we got was between $175 a night to, I think, $230 a night, if my memory serves me right. Um, but it was several different facilities with different rates that we got. Um, most of the facilities were four-star, five-star facilities that would come in at um, rates of $300, $400. So just by a comparative analysis of daily rates, I believe value for money was received. Um, the, the, the issue of, as I said before, yeah, that, that's the answer to the question. The second part of the question, um, I don't know whether finance or the Auditor General can answer that. The second part, he asks if there was any evidence of misappropriation of funds related to these expenditures. There are several red flags, Mr. Chairman, that suggest that a different type of audit is required. And Permanent Secretary, you did indicate that you wanted assurance in certain areas. Um, where the Auditor General's Department is not available because of the strain on our resources, the, you can ask the internal auditor to undertake such reviews. As it pertains to the other part of your question, um, member, I requested and received only yesterday um, a printout of the total payments made because I wanted to put myself in a position here this morning to say, despite what the report said, the Ministry of Health subsequently addressed this issue with respect to the other payments that were made. Um, based on information coming to me yesterday, and that's why I mentioned the 619 million, which is still of concern to me. It would require a different audit member before I can respond AG, conclusively. AG, you mentioned 619 million. Six hundred and nineteen million. Yes, I received a report which said that up to March, because as I said, we did a preliminary audit. We did not go back in. So I just needed to have an idea of the total maids to the quarantine facilities. So the PFO provided a printout yesterday, which, which I received yesterday, which showed that um, up to the end of 2021, I think, no, 2021, the payments were up to 2021. Um, 619 million had been spent. 2023. I looked through the dates and I didn't see. It does say Mar it says total payment at March 31st, 2023, but the payments were actually executed between June 2020 and mm. November 2021. Right. Yeah, because at, by, the, be, by 2021 be we had um, shuttered all of our transactions. So Correct. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, Chairman, um, if I may, I welcome the auditors. I welcome the auditors as the entrance interview, if the team will recall, it was done on Zoom, and I told them, be thorough, be thorough. We need, we need to know. We need to strengthen the system. We are committed in the executive management of the Ministry of Health and Wellness to, 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 to strengthen the system. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in good governance. And so, we invite them any, at any opportunity to review these transactions. I've made this point over and over again. 81% of the Ministry's expenditure is done in the regional health authorities, 81%. We have received no assurances on the, those expenditure from the Auditor General's department. I, I can assure you, I am sure the Auditor General will take up your invitation and look at the regional health authorities, and you'll probably have to come back here after those reports are done. Sure, no problem. <laughs> Auditor General, then member siblings. Chairman, I want to just highlight, because we have spent so much time 
speaking about purchase order, that the matter with the payments, the payment of 124 million, which is the total payments of 124 million to eight suppliers for infrastructural work was also done using purchase order. Absolutely. And while we can have a conversation around risk management, the same principle applies. We had to execute the infrastructure works. Let me give context. Within one, we came out of the first, the second spike in COVID-19 in August, or we came off the first spike in August, or something to that effect. But we recognized that if we went into a, sec a third spike or a second spike, there was no way that the hospital system could respond sufficiently. We must build bed space. We had to. And you recall, Chairman, that at the beginning we were contemplating the national stadium and national arena and whether or not the national arena could be utilized. And the technical team did their analysis and they were like, it was near impossible because we just didn't have the human resources to do it. So we had to build facilities close to or in hospitals so that the staffing could be shared between the regular operations of the facility and the COVID wards. We knew that Christmas was coming and we knew the movements that would take place in Christmas. And we knew, based on the dynamics of the, um, the virus, that we would have a spike right after. And so we, we had to move exceptionally um, quickly in executing. We developed the, the BQ. We developed the, the different instruments. And we launched the tender. We did use a purchase order to pay. However, the purchase order was supported by the certificates, and the certificates were quantified by a, a QS in terms of quantities and what the value of the payments would be for each transaction. So the risk around the application was managed. Is it the most efficient way? No. For the infrastructure part of it, I would, have, I would agree that a contract, a more formal contract would be a, a more robust way of managing risk. But the context, the context. And if you want to see value for money, go to those infrastructure that we built during COVID. They are standing right now, and they are well built. Thank you. All right, member Siblis, then member Guy. Thank you, Chair. Chair, <clears throat> I hear the permanent secretary, I hear the passion. And I just want to look at a few years. Compliance audit. I have to agree with the PS that in, in a compliance audit, there needs to be rules, but the law, yes, but there can be policy, P.S. I know you, you keep on talking about the, the law, right? But also policy. They need, the auditor would always have to look to the policy that was breached. And it is within your right to ask what policy, what laws were breached. And so I support you on that. And so I would not conclude that there's a, a lagoon, a lagoon that you are trying to seek. And I would not support the point that there need to be a plug. Why? I, rem I can recall in this house the debates that took place with regards to 
the COVID-19 pandemic and the different opinions from different members what need to be done and what need to be done like yesterday. I recall those, those, those debates. And so I agree with you that context is important. I will also share with you as well that a purchase order is, can be used as a contract. In fact, we don't have to have anything in writing for a contract. However, however, as spenders of the, con the country's money, we must do so carefully. We must do so carefully. So I understand the Auditor General's point of view with regards to her concern not being able as an auditor to, to compare and to, to review certain things against certain standards. I understand that. But what is more important at the time when we had the COVID? Many of us here who are behaving brave and saying all manner of things here inside and outside. We were scared. We were depending on you, the team, the how many thousands. And all of us were, were praying that you, you get it right. <laughs> so I, 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 there are lessons learned. We need to look back. We need to see how we can improve if a situation like this reoccur. What measures or procedures we can now document that must be used. But for me and the people of Carolina Northern, when I was up there and the, the nurse, the nurses, and the doctors who came up there, and we have to be running up and down, and persons were scared and in line, and were bundling up, and we say, we were scared again. This is an outbreak in trying to prevent it. So I want to thank you guys. Thank you. But in thanking you, I want to say, we still need to look at the lessons learned. We cannot throw the baby with the bath, right? We can look at the lessons learned, and we can just move. But it is not, I, am, I can't look at this report and with your response and say, you did bad. No, absolutely. You did well, and I thank you and your team. Members, we, we have a wrap-up at 12.30, and... There are some questions I have on the, um, the third report, which I don't think we can get to today, um, in relation to there are a number of things related to estimates for infrastructure work, other things which we can't get to today. So I'm going to, I think we'll have to come back. Just for, just for this particular report, you have done the first two, but we have to come back to the third, the third one, because there are some substantive issues in the third report. I have two questions in, in closing. Um, one, I'm still getting complaints, I'm coming to you, member guy, about arrears owed to suppliers of particularly services, janitorial and other services. And I know the Minister of Finance had indicated in two budget cycles that provisions were made to clear and cover a number of those arrears. So that's one. And then secondly, can you confirm whether the ministry has actually, members, just, just one, made the adjustments to 
pay the suppliers the minimum wage which would have been agreed for 2022 from the 7,000 to the 9,000 because again I'm getting complaints that people are being paid below the current minimum wage because the ministry hasn't made the adjustments to those contracts to pay the $9,000 which was agreed in 2022. So on the second question, um, Chairman, we got instructions from the Ministry of Finance on how we should treat with the, with the transaction for security firms. Um, we are in the process now of having the, the conversations internally with the regional health authorities that have the bulk of the um, contracts with these providers. Um, coming out of that, I'll be have a, a better um, position to give you on the mat on that matter. And when you and when you come next week, if you could also Is next week are coming. Yeah, just to, to deal with the third report, the third one. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. no, we're, we're going to finish this next week. All right, right? no problem. No but, problem. But I on also the first on matter, that issue, if you could also tell us how you plan to deal with the new award of the minimum wage, which will be implement, implemented sure. June 1st. I, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be able to provide you with that. And then um, on the matter of the next question, we continue. It's a dynamic process. I'll give you, um, we are continuing to have conversation with our suppliers because during COVID, certain transactions were done at the local level. And so a lot of the things are not at center. They're at the regional health authorities. And sometimes there's not a in, in the mind of the supplier, it's Ministry of Health. Um, and so they don't, they're not making the distinction between what is at the regional health authorities and what is at the ministry. But I'll, I'll provide a better assessment for you next. If you could, if you could bring next week just an idea right, of right, the, right. not an idea, a report of those arrears and the aging report on what is owed to the suppliers. All right? PAC. Huh? For PAC. Yeah, man, when you come back okay. next week. Member Clark, you have a final question. Mr. Chairman, just a concern I would raise with you, just to say that why not ask the Permanent Secretary and his team to come back, like two weeks' time, give them enough time to refresh themselves if they have to, and also give them some time to do some work too. So give them a two week, and we come back at that time. Yeah. I would uh, say... I, I would be guided. Remember, all right, there are three reports. The one which we haven't been able to touch today is the, the one entitled Performance Audit Effectiveness of Jamaica's Institutional Framework. I don't have an issue if you want two Mr. weeks. Mr. Chairman, we, I, I, have don't no issue. I don't understand all of that. I, don't I have no issue. You, I two don't weeks is better. That, but we can work with that. But give, give them enough time. Give them the time so that we can accuse them of doing things hastily. They were ready to deal with it today, but I don't mind the two weeks. <laughs> but, but all of us know the limitations of the parliament, and we have to prepare for parliament at 2 o'clock. So let me thank you. We have had a robust meeting, and um, I think there are some things that finance needs to definitively indicate so that there's guidance, not just for the Ministry of Health, but other ministries going forward. And we will reconvene in two weeks to deal specifically with the, the third report, which we didn't get to. Thank you very much. Can I have a motion for adjournment? I'll have Hold the on. chairman, Member but with the understanding, Pamela. chairman, that yes. you had recognized, but I'll, I'll put it for two weeks' time, the question. Two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.